Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And who's ready for some hangouts and headlines this fine Monday morning, just a little bit after 7 a.m. here in the Eastern Time Zone of the United States? I hope everybody is excited. I hope everybody's ready for a fun, fun week this week. This is the last week that my girls are in school. We're very excited about that. Everybody's ready for summer break. I hope you all had a great weekend, did some fun stuff. I got to see that band performance I might have mentioned last week or maybe during the uh, 10-hour live stream that we did on Saturday, uh, which I will talk about a little bit more in just a minute. But my my daughter got to play the flute, performed the Star Spangled Banner uh, in front of a baseball game. It was very, very cool, and I am super proud of her. So I wanted to make sure I said that right at the front end of this video in case she caught this. It's a little bit, it's a little bit early for her to be running around and getting ready for school today. Uh, but I am very, very proud of you, honey. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, where is everybody calling in from uh, today? Uh, I did also want to mention that for whatever reason, if you recall last week, I, I had to do some things with the uh, stream yard as the technical stuff behind the scenes wasn't quite working. Uh, it seems to be a little bit better today, but it is going slowly and picking up the chats. <laughs> Uh, from this side of the screen to this side of the screen, I won't get into too much of the back end technicalities. I think it's functioning now, uh, but it does appear to be functioning a little bit more slowly than I would like. So please bear with me as I try to grab things like good evening from China. That is awesome. I think that's the first time that I have seen China here. Hi from Texas. Hi from Milford, Michigan. That's close. I know where that is. Good afternoon from England. And I would try to do an English accent to, to help that out, but I, you don't want that from me. Uh, everybody would be disappointed, uh, and that wouldn't be very fun. Uh, calling in from Denmark. I do like that I use the phrase calling in there, like I'm running a radio show, old school style. Cornwall in the UK. Brisbane, I think is how I was told to pronounce this one. Australia. Hi from Seattle. Oh, it's super early over there. Good afternoon from Israel. Hello from Alaska, Serbia, North Carolina, Alabama. I love having these conversations with all of you folks from all around the country, all around the world, uh, because uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, so thank you, everybody, for giving me all these wonderful locations. I I'm think I'm going to start the stream always with this because I just think it's very, very cool to think of all of us getting together, talking about some interesting things, having a fun hangout to start our day here in the United States to have a fun afternoon or lunchtime period in places like uh, the UK, uh, and just to have these conversations together, because I think that is uh, pretty, pretty awesome. I also wanted to grab the super chat here. J. Bertie Lewis, how is it that the story that should have ended with an editor's note has somehow turned into Inception? If you guys haven't read this article we're going to go through today, uh, get excited, because there is some absolutely crazy stuff. And in case you really want to have some inception, not only is this about an editor's note in a different article in the same paper that the journalist is writing for, it also has an editor's note as a correction slash update to the story. So it just keeps going on and on and on. Uh, and if you didn't watch the Washington Post this week, I'll talk about this a little bit more when we go into the article itself. This last week, the Washington Post had a completely separate, but maybe not completely separate, set of events that was also wild, in which the executive editor tried to tell their reporters to stop sniping at each other on Twitter. It continued. One of their major reporters got fired over it. And all of this is happening in the background. Uh, so it's been a wild time at that particular newspaper. Uh, and as someone that is very interested in watching how messages go out to people, how people pick up news and stories and what they believe about them, this is absolutely fascinating. And I think I've said before, uh, in this space especially, I'm not interested in just bashing the media. That's not what we do here, although it might sound like it from time to time. It is in closely examining, examining. good morning, everybody, happy Monday, examining uh, what they're looking at, how they're doing it, how they're sending out this news. And there is no better story in, in terms of my interest and my curiosity than this one. It just so happens that I'm fairly close to the subject matter here. But we would have been covering this anyway uh, if I had seen it happen in a different context entirely. Uh, so thank you so much for the super chat. It is a wild one today. Uh, now, before we get into anything more specific, 
I did want to mention some of the things that I was doing this past weekend, right? So I mentioned I went to see my daughter perform in her band. That was very, very awesome. We also participated in something that I am super, super proud of, super excited about. If you didn't know, if you didn't see, uh, I was the co-host for a charity stream that brought together a whole host of panelists that had otherwise talked about Debt Be Heard over on Legal Bites. Alita and I uh, put together this stream. We had been talking about this really since uh, I, the third week of the trial, something along those lines, in terms of doing something uh, that would really help the community have a centralized place to give back uh, and to, to talk about all of the things that we had been through over the past two months while also supporting a good cause. Uh, and we had aimed uh, at, at putting together $35,000 for the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, which of course, if you follow Deaf Be Heard, was one of the places that was stiffed uh, by Amber Heard uh, when she said that she was going to give her divorce settlement to charity. Uh, and we put this together. We were planning on only doing it for um, you know a, a few hours. We didn't know how much uptake there would be on this. Uh, and it turned into what I, I'm calling a 10 hour stream. I think it's actually a nine and a half hour stream, but we obviously were preparing for it before uh, we got on and went live. And uh, it didn't just uh, meet the goal. It didn't just double the goal. It smashed the goal. Uh, and you will see the link in the description to this video. This campaign is actually going to stay open for the foreseeable future. When we finished off on Saturday, I think the number was at about $128,000, which is just crazy. And I'm so proud of the community on this. And I said this a bunch of times on the stream, but this isn't about me. This isn't about Alita. This isn't about any one of the panelists or lawyers on YouTube or anything else like that. Something like this is not possible without a community as wonderful and as generous as those uh, in this one. And I am so, so grateful and so, so happy for watching this happen. As you can see, it's at 140,000 right now. That's actually like 12,000 or more uh, above where we left it at on Saturday evening. So people have continued to put money in, continue to add to the campaign here. Uh, and it is just so, so wonderful. Um, and unfortunately, that stream presently isn't available uh, over at Legal Bites. Uh, she's pulled it down uh, for right now uh, in order to make sure that it is 100% clear uh, that none of this money is going to us, that you can't super chat on that stream. You can't super thanks on that stream right now. She wants to be very clear. This money didn't even go through YouTube. It didn't go through YouTube. It didn't go through Google. It didn't go through Alita. It didn't go through me. It went straight to the hospital. This is how they like to run their fundraisers. It is a direct link to them. Uh, and so you can't see that stream right now. I am hopeful uh, that it will go up, um, uh, go back up soon. Uh, but right now, just know that this campaign is fantastic and you, you are absolutely wonderful as a community uh, and it warmed my heart the entire time. If you're interested in that, check out the link here. Uh, but I am I'm just so, so happy and I, I, I don't know how to express myself uh, better on that. So thank you everyone uh, for doing that. I don't know how many of you were actually uh, in there with us, uh, but it was very, very awesome. And uh, there's a whole lot of things uh, that uh, that people did on that stream for nine hours. We played games. Uh, we talked to interesting individuals. We analyzed interviews. Uh, we did all sorts of things that I am very hopeful I can tell you you can go check out uh, in the very near future, uh, but I can't uh, right now. Uh, in terms of other housekeeping, I do also want to mention if you're looking at the channel right now, my channel, uh, you might see that there is another stream. Uh, that is coming on today. If you have never visited us, us over at the Season Gaming Bitcast, where I do video game streams every Sunday, except for yesterday, because as I mentioned, I was at a ball game. Um, you will see that there is a stream on this channel that is going to be a simulcast. It's going to be uh, on the Season Gaming channel. We're also going to be broadcasting it here, which you can check out if you are so interested on this channel, um, so that. Uh, Wherever you're coming from, you can see us. We're going to be doing that this afternoon. And I think I actually have this set to redirect to Season Gaming. It'll be some hours after that. Uh, but if you are interested in just keeping it on in the background, you can 100% do that. If you're not totally understand, I think it'll be hours separate between when this ends and that one begins. But if you see that, that is what that is about. Uh, I heard some people saying, I kind of want a clip of that. I might have sung. I might have sung on that stream. Uh, I might have done... Uh, some Reading Rainbow uh, theme song singing. I believe I sang some other things, uh, but honestly, it was a very long stream, so I can't remember everything that I did in that stream. So 
you know you're having fun when that happens, right? So hopefully that stream goes back up soon. Uh, but for now, just know that I am so, so appreciative of everybody that visited, everything that happened over there, and all of you as well here this morning. I don't know how much overlap there was. Uh, I don't know that I did a great job actually telling you that that's what was happening uh, on Saturday of this week. So that's my apologies if anybody would have been interested in that and didn't know that it was even happening over at Legal Bites. Otherwise, let's talk about headlines. So I promised a headline. I've got a headline. This is in the Washington Post. Remember, democracy dies in darkness. Opinion, Taylor the Renz said an editor was to blame. Is that okay? Now, in and of itself, that's kind of a weird headline. It kind of presupposes that you understand exactly what was happening at the Washington Post for a good chunk of time uh, and know exactly what this is talking about. If you don't, I'm not sure exactly how this is going to communicate that to you, other than the fact that, hey, this looks a little bit like a headlines thumbnail, right? This is this is the article that we have read through a couple of times now because it keeps popping up. Who won the Depp Heard trial? Content creators that went all in. It's got a Taylor Lorenz tweet and a big, long editor's note in a kind of graphical styling. Uh, and if you have that picture and that headline, maybe you're interested in this article. But just in terms of advertising, it's kind of a weird, uh, factless headline that we're going to start out with today. But we know what it means, right? Because we've been following this story and we know that Taylor Lorenz wrote an article about how the new media, uh, as she describes it, was eating the lunch of the old media and the old media needed to pay attention. And it was important primarily because the new media streamers, me, Alita at Legal Bites, others, uh, don't have the same ethical guidelines and boundaries that the journalists find themselves constrained by, which, of course, adds to the irony that what we're going to talk about today is a series of errors or potential communication flaws and those piling on each other. And I think there's a couple of reasons why this article was written, uh, and I'm not sure that it's because the Washington Post asked for it. In fact, I would I would offer that they maybe didn't, especially where Mr. Wemple comes out on this article. Uh, but there's one reason that I think is, is important as I have analyzed what's happened here uh, and doesn't get a satisfactory answer. And then there's the reason that is uh, suggested by this headline, which is, is it okay for Taylor Lorenz to call out an editor? And spoiler alert, Mr. Wemple is going to find that it is, that it is okay. Now, you might think, okay, so they're playing defensive ball for Taylor Lorenz. They've got the shields up. I will tell you, and we'll get there as we go through the wording, this is not a terribly Taylor Lorenz-friendly article. And that's in and of itself unusual, because as I mentioned earlier in this video, the Washington Post is having a problem with comedy, with a T, with friendliness between its journalists and has gone so far as to basically go out there and say, you guys need to stop attacking each other. It is the policy of the Washington Post that our journalists don't attack each other because we need to have some level of professionalism and trust in the institution and our journalists that our uh, fans, our customers can actually have for us. So the fact that that happens before this article goes up and this article I'm going to be frank, throws some shade at Taylor Lorenz is interesting in and of itself. In an article, mind you, not a tweet. So this is either more official and less problematic or more official and more problematic, depending on what perspective you bring to the table. Like I said, the Washington Post is the gift that does not end on this kind of thing. So let's look at this. First, we note a big old update. We're going to actually skip that. A few highlights here. Just ignore uh, you know, bless our mess. Uh, we're going to go straight to the article here. This is how the article originally started. Washington Post staff writer Taylor Lorenz on Saturday posted a Twitter thread declaring that it was not she who inserted an erroneous line into her article. It was her editor. I did not write the line and was not aware it was inserted, wrote Lorenz. And then this link points actually to Oliver Darcy of CNN that captured the pictures of Taylor Lorenz. And I'm not sure exactly why it's done that way, other than the fact that Ms. Lorenz has been on and off with kind of privating her entire Twitter th uh, thread since this all happened. And if you're writing an article in the Washington Post, you want to include links, you maybe want to make sure that it isn't something that is inaccessible at any given time that someone might read it. So you see here, we've gone over these tweets. We've went over everything here. As the author here suggests, her first tweet last Thursday, an incorrect line, was added to a story of mine before publishing 
due to a miscommunication with an editor. I did not write the line. I was not aware it was inserted. I asked for it to be removed right after the story went live. And again, giving the benefit of the doubt to Taylor Lorenz, one presumes she didn't ask for it to be removed in a stealth edit that the Washington Post actually engaged in, but following whatever rules the editors have at the Washington Post. And we're going to talk about those as part of this article. Um, so that's what we've got here so far. Taylor Lorenz says it was an editor's fault. It wasn't my fault. And that can be seen as blame shifting a little bit. But of course, if it was, in fact, the editor that did this, we're going to talk about it in this article. There is some legitimacy to a journalist saying, hey, I shouldn't have this crush my byline. People assume that I did this. We should talk about who did this actually. Uh, and so I'm sympathetic to that position a little bit, as is this author, we will see. But certainly coming out of the gate and saying it wasn't me, it was an editor is blame shifting. I mean, we have to be honest there. This should have been a small correction for a miscommunication, but it turned into a multi-day media cycle intentionally aimed at discrediting the Washington Post and me. And we've talked about that in this space as well, which is to say, it certainly appears that there are factions in journalism that don't like Taylor Lorenz uh, and did, in fact, probably jump on this more than if it had been somebody else. That doesn't make it wrong to report on, which is where Taylor Lorenz kind of gets tripped up. But she clearly thinks that this is something that is heightened, that is an attack style against her personally. Uh, and I can't say that she is wrong insofar as there really was a lot of jumping on this particular story. One takeaway from Lorenz's thread was unmistakable. In a series of tweets, Lorenz blames her editor for having inserted the error into her story and says she is the victim of a bad faith campaign. And again, this is Oliver Darcy's tweet, right? This is what he says. In a series of tweets, blames her editor and says she's a victim of a bad faith campaign. This is important, right? I just said that Taylor Lorenz maybe has a point if an editor actually did this, as any of us would agree in terms of if we wrote an article, somebody inserted something that we didn't think was true and that we didn't know about, that could potentially be uh, something that we would say, hey, that's not my fault. Uh, now that miscommunication is still kind of passive voice, so we don't know what that means. But this paragraph from Eric Wemple gives away the game in terms of what he's thinking here. One takeaway from Lorenz's thread was unmistakable. And that's what Oliver Darcy takes away. Now, he says it's unmistakable, yet if we recall what Taylor Lorenz actually responds to Oliver Darcy, it's, no, actually, this type of coverage is so irresponsible and dangerous. It's misrepresenting my words to amplify a manufactured outrage campaign by right-wing media and radicalized influencers, which is driving a vicious harassment smear campaign against me. CNN is gleefully piling on. Now, as we've talked about in this space, I, I've neither harassed nor smeared Taylor Lorenz. I had no idea who she was before this story. She's as ever welcome to come on uh, and talk with me here in Hangouts and Headlines if she is so interested. Uh, but you now have a journalist at the Washington Post saying that Oliver Darcy's takeaway is obvious, even though he knows, and he will use it at the end of his article, that Taylor Lorenz came out and said, no, 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 that's not what any of this means. You're misrepresenting my words, or more specifically, the CNN is, or anybody else engaged in this vicious harassment and smear campaign. And now the Washington Post journalist says the actual concept here is unmistakable. Keep that in mind, because this is the Washington Post version of shade, and it'll become more obvious at the end of the article but here is the separation from Taylor Lorenz. And we will see it when we get the update that this is framed as the Taylor Lorenz situation uh, by this author. Blaming editors for mistakes sounds like a craven act, and indeed it can be, but it also happens occasionally at prominent US media outlets. Lorenz's pointed to a culpa, it's blaming someone else, is at odds with the spirit of post policy, however. And in this case, it received approval from the post's masthead according to a source at the paper. A Post spokesperson says, we provided input that we asked she take into consideration. Now, this paragraph is enormously difficult to read. Uh, and I will talk to you about why. I don't know whether to blame Eric Wemple. I don't know whether to blame the Washington Post. Maybe I should blame Eric Wemple's editor. I don't know. But if we go through this line by line, it becomes apparent that it's unclear what happens towards the end of this paragraph, right? Blaming editors for mistakes sounds like a craven act. Uh, and indeed it can be, okay. That's not committing one way or the other, but we can throw that sentence out. But it also happens occasionally at prominent U.S. media outlets. 
okay. So here he's going to establish that you can actually blame editing. You can blame the editor at various places that perform journalism in especially the United States. Eric Wemple, if you go look at his bio, is actually kind of the media watchdog person for the Washington Post. And occasionally, apparently, he aims his spotlight at his employer itself. Then we get to the third sentence. Lorenz is pointed to a culpa is at odds with the spirit of Post policy, however. And here he's setting up his argument. We'll see it when we get a little bit further in the article. Uh, but here he's saying, okay, blaming gland editors can be bad, but it also is happening in a lot of outlets. But it's worth noting that this outlet, the one that I work for and the one that Taylor Lorenz works for, says, no, you can't do that. And in this case, it received approval from the post masthead, according to a source at the paper. Explain that sentence. What is the it in that sentence? What is it referring to? The previous sentence says, Lorenz has pointed to a culpa is at odds with the spirit of post policy, however. And in this case, it, that's probably not Taylor Lorenz, I don't think, uh, received approval from the post masthead, according to a source at the paper. So is the it the post? Is the it the masthead? Is the it the post policy? And who's giving permission to this? Now, I think this is intended to suggest even though that it is really throwing me, that Taylor Lorenz was given permission to blame the editor. But then we get to the last sentence. A, a Post spokesperson says, we provided input that we asked she take into consideration. That doesn't sound like an institution that is thrilled with what Taylor Lorenz put out there on Twitter. Because you could easily say, hey, we told her, this is the situation, this is the editor, you know what? Hey, I think that this is something that we should have talked about a little bit more. So the it received approval from the post mass head, according to a source of the paper. I don't know how to read it, except that it is Lorenz blaming the editor. So I, I guess if you're going to take the concept of the two Acopa as the, the, the noun here and say that that's what received permission, I guess that's how we can read it. But then the we ask she take into consideration is just odd, right? Because you'd say effectively here as the post spokesperson, we gave permission. And that's not what this says. So I don't know whether Eric Wemple is taking a leap. I don't know whether he's got different background from the Washington Post. He obviously works there. But in any event, this paragraph for the lay person, heck, even for the lawyer, is tremendously difficult to unpack. And I don't know whether that's intentional or not, but that's where we go from here. The imbroglio kicked off a week ago with the publication of Lorenz's article on the internet, Content Creators Who Thrive from the Johnny Depp Amber Heard Defamation Trial. The original version said that two creators, Alita Majeka and the anonymous That Umbrella Guy, had been contacted for comment. Foxnews.com reported that the paper deleted that claim with a stealth edit. The Post published a series of corrections and an editor's note attempting to address the situation. It now reads, and we'll talk about that editor's note in a second. The weird part about this paragraph is the foxnews.com reference, right? And we've seen this used by Taylor Lorenz. We've seen her discuss right-wing media campaigns and all these various things. And it is certainly true that various bits of Fox and others on the right side of the United States journalistic output uh, did leap at that. However, you're Eric Wemple. You're reporting on the Washington Post. This was stealth edited. I can attest to this with personal knowledge, as I can show in the first video that I did covering this, that there is a change from what was existent in that article. It is otherwise unnoted. If you are a journalist at the Washington Post, it seems to me that you can admit to that here, especially since the editor's note actually says, during that process, the Post removed the incorrect statement from the story, but did not note its removal, a violation of our corrections policy. This is an admitted error from the Washington Post already. Why does foxnews.com enter into this paragraph, right? We do rhetorical analysis here. What is happening? Foxnews.com reported that the paper deleted the claim with a stealth edit. Should be, but the paper deleted the claim with a stealth edit, right? They admit to it. You don't need a third party sourcing on this. This, to me, looks like it's designed for the same intent that Taylor Lorenz calls up the right-wing media, that 
if, if you're reading this quickly or you're otherwise following along uh, on a skimming kind of basis, then you say, oh, well, Fox News, I can disregard because I disregard Fox News. And very often I'd say you're wise to do so. I'd also say you're very wise to do so with respect to Washington Post articles, as it turns out. And that goes for most outlets that can go either direction on these kinds of things. But why frame it in this way unless you mean to discredit it in some form or fashion? I don't know. I have no idea on this one, but it gets weird. Here's the editor's note. I've highlighted, of course, in fact, only Majeka was asked via Instagram as the big thing that continues to annoy on this entire saga, right? We've got this huge editor's note. It's more than 100 words long. It goes at the beginning of this article. Taylor Lorenz has complained about it. Eric Wemple is reporting on Taylor Lorenz complaining about it. And yet, right now in the article, survives this concept. The first published version of the story stated incorrectly that internet influencers Alita Majeka, uh, Alita Majeka and that umbrella guy had been contacted for comment before publication. In fact, only Majeka was asked via Instagram. And we know that this appears to be untrue. We know that Alita says it's untrue. More importantly, we know that Taylor Lorenz says it's untrue. Her third tweet, after the story went live, I reached out to both YouTubers. And yet, the Washington Post puts this as its editor's note, and as Eric Wemple here of the Washington Post says, Hot Air's John Sexton pointed out that by Lorenz's own account, she didn't contact either YouTuber for comment until after the story went live, a circumstance in conflict with the editor's note and which indicates that the request for comment to Majeka occurred prior to publication via Instagram. This is obvious to everyone. Taylor Lorenz does not appear to be fighting this, but the Washington Post put this in its editor's note and... Here's the kicker. They refuse to answer Eric Wemple about this particular notion. Eric Wemple, journalist for the Washington Post, interviews the Washington Post on this topic, and the Washington Post says, nah. Or as he puts it in this article, we've asked the Post for clarification on this point because it matters. This is Eric Wemple doubling down, right? He could have just said, hey, they refuse to answer. The Post refuses comment, whatever. He says, we've asked for clarification because it matters. This is an important thing. I'm going to underline it. I'm going to hang a lampshade on it. This is critical because why? If the Post can't nail down the facts in an editor's note, after looking at this thing five separate times, where else should we trust it to do so? Bingo. Absolutely. As much as Taylor Lorenz or others uh, defending what has happened here want to say this isn't important. And I think that calling Alita at legal bites up before the article goes to publish isn't important. I think this is an immaterial factor in this article. The fact that they can't get this thing right, that they are in full control of, that they have the knowledge base on, that they're going public with in ways that are separate from what they are telling the world that doesn't follow this that closely is enormously important because they are the ones that are reporting on everything else that you might otherwise read in their paper. And Eric Wemple is exactly right on that. And what does the Washington Post say to him? That stands as is, says a Post spokesperson. We won't be able to get into what the internal discussions were. That's all we're going to get. And I think part of the reason that this article exists, honestly, is because Eric Wemple thinks this is important, thinks it matters, and it doesn't make any sense to him, right? This seems very clear. You put in your editor's note that Alita Majeka was, in fact, asked on Instagram to comment before publication, right? And others have pointed out, well, if you strictly parse this sentence, in fact, only Majeka was asked via Instagram, it only implies that it's before publication. And that's really after publication. They're playing tricks with you. One, no, it doesn't. The in fact points back to before publication. And so they are done and dead on that. But let's say that that was a successful trickeration. That is exactly the opposite of what you want from your journalistic press. You do not want to believe that you have to parse it like it's a damn contract with opposing counsel to figure out what the truth is, that they're trying to trick you in every corner. So honestly, if this was a successful trick, and it is not, it would actually be more damning for the Washington Post because you cannot have that level of lack of trust with who you're otherwise paying to provide you with new services. And I can't speak for the Washington Post's circulation level or profitability, but if that kind of thing happens. This is bad enough. If it really is determined that they're trying to trick you on everything all the time, whether it matters or not, there is no possible way I could recommend anyone to read anything from an outlet that does that kind of thing. And so I think Eric Wemple wrote this article 
in part because of the question that he asked at the top, but also to highlight this. This is ridiculous. The Washington Post is being called out on all corners for exactly this, and they say that stands as is. Sorry, bro. We're going to refuse to answer your question, fellow journalist of the Washington Post. And that's the big ticket item here to me. We'll see that he comes out with the conclusion that it should be okay to question editors. I'm not as invested in the answer to that question as a non-journalist uh, as I am in what you go out with to your customers, to your readers, to the folks that you are purported to be telling the truth to. And now I don't know whether I can believe that you're the actual Washington Post. You put the date in the masthead. I don't know if I can believe that if this is the level that we're going to get to. But let's talk about the second question. Another question hanging over the editor's note relates to policy. What if the first iteration had asserted that the mistake came off the keyboard of an editor? Any such declaration would grind against a long-standing provision of the Post's Standards Guide, which reads, we do not attribute blame to individual reporters or editors, for example, because of a reporting error or because of an editing error. But we may note that an error was the result of a production problem or because incorrect information came to us from a trusted source, wire services, individuals quoted, etc. The policy controls how the newspaper articulates corrections and editor's notes and has a more tenuous sway over tweets and other statements from the Post. Now, this actually goes to the heart of what the Post has been dealing with right now, which is, is Twitter the workplace? What are we allowed to control of our journalists over there? Taylor Lorenz doesn't ask for a correction or an editor's note that says it was the editor's fault. She goes out on Twitter and proclaims it to the world. And so Eric Wemple is kind of figuring out what that should mean here as he works through his opinion piece and says, look, we're not allowed to attribute blame to individual reporters or editors formally, but it holds a more tenuous sway over tweets and other statements. And this is how the Post journalists wound up sniping at each other for a long period of time. Now, the Post wound up firing the journalist that was doing that. It's unclear whether they intend to take a stronger tack against Twitter and social media in general, but it wouldn't surprise me if that's where they wound up because they've had so much difficulty in the last, I don't know, a few months at least on this particular topic. So maybe they go in and their corrections policy more specifically associates itself with social media. And you'll see that recommended here by Mr. Wemple. In a 2006 column, then post ombudsman, Deborah Howell traced the philosophical roots of the post's aversion to due to an editing error. Then ex executive editor Len Downey told Howell, reporters get bylines and prizes when they do well and editors don't. So they shouldn't be thrown under the bus effectively. Peter Baker, then a White House correspondent at the Post, countered, writers are held accountable because our names are on the bylines. Why should writers be held accountable when it's not their fault? And those are decent arguments. Honestly, in a vacuum, I would tend to side with the journalist here. If, it, if your name is on something and you didn't put it in there, I don't have any problem saying, hey, I didn't put it in there. Correct, says the New York Times. And so here, Mr. Wemple's pointing out, as he indicated earlier on in the article, other outlets do it differently. The New York Times, for instance, that's because a correction frontally addresses an issue in a May 9th story, and they say, because of an editing error, an earlier version of this article mis misidentified Lincoln College as a historically black college. It is a predominantly black college, not a Department of Education listed HBCU. So an editor went in, changed a reference, and the journalist here would have been blamed for it, except for the New York Times got in front of it and said, well, that's an editor. I don't have any problem with this approach. And I think Eric Wemple doesn't have any problem with this approach. Now, of course, he's tilted. He's biased. He's a journalist. He wants to be able to say if something like this were to happen to him, he could blame the editor. So that's fine, but it doesn't make his argument wrong. Philip B. Corbett, associate managing editor for Standards at the Times, tells the Eric Wemple blog, and I looked this up. I, I could not find it. It appears to be a reference to the Washington Post uh, item, and I don't know what relation it has to Eric Wemple as a person and as a journalist for the Washington Post. So it's a little bit of an odd reference here. He does it to the blog via email. That has long been our normal practice. It's simply an effort to be fair to reporters whose names are on the story and shield them from criticism if they aren't to blame for a mistake. All that makes sense. Checks out. Many outlets, including CNN, the Associated Press, USA Today, Slate, MSNBC, The Daily Beast, and yes, even The Post, have at least dabbled in this formulation. And this is an eclectic, what, what an eclectic group of journalistic outlets, I don't know what you want to do with Slate and the Daily Beast in this formulation, uh, to bring in uh, to this particular argument. But he's trying to establish, hey, a lot of folks let you blame the editor, though a CNN spokeswoman says it's not policy to attribute mistakes to editors. They want to focus on what is being corrected. 
uh, or the AP spokeswoman says that. Decades ago, and here comes his thesis, the post's institutional approach to corrections made more sense. The work of reporters back then wasn't fly specked on social media sites, dissected for mistakes and repurposed for the next instance of wrongdoing or alleged wrongdoing. These days it is. If the argument for the post's policy were ever correct, it's not anymore. So not actually a ton of argumentative evidence here. Uh, we go from other people do it to social media has changed everything. And I don't know whether that's accurate or not, right? I have no idea. I have a feeling that even in the 1920s, journalistic output was still evaluated pretty closely. I know for a fact that a lot of newspapers and other journalistic outlets had ombudsmen that actually looked after the overall brand of the institution and was essentially the devil's advocate role against some of the things that the institution was doing and explaining certain choices to the readership. Those roles don't appear to exist anymore. So I'm not positive that I buy this as an effective argument, but I'm not sure it needs to be. I, I do find myself more sympathetic to if your byline is on there and somebody else changes it, you should be able to say that. Uh, but I find that as a kind of notion of justness or rightness uh, rather than social media is looking at our stuff more closely. Because as a non-journalist looking at this, I'm not terribly sympathetic to you're getting called out more because you're making more mistakes is a reason why you should change what you're allowed to say about how those mistakes were made. I don't think that actually follows from the logic of social media, but that's his overall premise. And if the Post revisits its correction policy, it may want to lay down a guideline or two about how its journalists respond to social media brouhaha's. We have a responsibility to recognize these bad faith campaigns for what they are and when these sorts of things do and do not warrant acknowledgement, wrote Lorenz after the uproar over her Depp Heard piece. She also wrapped CNN. This type of coverage is so irresponsible and dangerous. It's misrepresenting my words to amplify a manufactured outrage campaign by right-wing media and radicalized influencers, which is driving a vicious harassment smear campaign against me CNN is gleefully piling on. So I told you, I promised you, he would come back to this because he clearly disagrees with Taylor Lorenz's position here as he indicates in his final line. That outrage works much better when a 135-word editor's note isn't hanging over your article. And that's where he finishes off things. So a ton of shade thrown at Taylor Lorenz in the original article that he writes, and that's before we even get to the update and note. Now, before we get to that update and note, I do have a couple of super chats. So let's talk about those. Let me know how you feel about Mr. Wemple's output, how the Washington Post just stonewalls him on what I consider to be the most important question arising out of this so that he can navel gaze on whether editors should be thrown under buses or not. Uh, but I still think it's useful to note that the Washington Post continues to spiral on this question in a way that I don't think we could have anticipated going in. So let's take a couple of those super chats. Uh, we, we did this one. Thank you so much, J. Birdie Lewis. Skew SME, Washington Post and their staff are so self-conscious and weirdly self-important. Smiley face, smiley face, smiley face. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's the nature of the beast to be at a, a, a national outlet, to think of yourself very high up on the food chain. We're seeing a lot of that writ large on social media. One story I could possibly bring up is some stuff that, the, that uh, I think it's NBC, it might be MSNBC, uh, tech correspondent person is continuing to bring up on social media over the last 24 or 48 hours. I'm not entirely certain what to do with tweets vis-a-vis uh, -vis headlines, uh, but we might cover it later on. There's certainly an aura of who are these people to come play in our playground. Uh, and I'm all for it. You know, bring it on for these arguments. SL, maybe sing our fight song to push to 150,000 go blue. I don't know. Can people uh, withdraw that money if they get upset? Uh, at uh, just a proud Wolverine and, and going blue on this kind of thing. Maybe I could do that. We'll see. We'll see. Thank you so much, SL. Aaron Flemons, the fundraiser was entertaining and informative. Wonderful. I'm sharing the link with my workmates today. Good work, Hogue. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate it. Britt Cormier, from before you read the article, Washington Post seems to be Ouroboros, and I never get that pronunciation right, with this drama, the snake that eats its tail. You know, uh, yes, I, uh, I think that they can't stop can't stop, won't stop <laughs> covering themselves. It's it's interesting, right? Because it's it's making things worse, but it's also kind of feeding a certain institutional egoism. It's it's bizarre, uh, but I love watching it because I think it is informative for our media outlets and and what 
to take from them when it's a news story that doesn't have all this going on with it, right? Zach Frisch, coffee money and a thanks for the breakdown. Thank you, Zach. I can't believe Washington Post wrote this article. This is like blameception. Is the Washington Post actually run by teenagers? Like, wow, have some poise already and quit petty fogging to try and save face. I don't recognize that term. Um, but uh, thank you so much, Zach. I really appreciate it. And apple pie, democracy dies in darkness is fitting. This is as convoluted and complex as a Kingdom Hearts game plot. They do talk a lot about the darkness in Kingdom Hearts. I love that tweet. Or I love that uh, super chat. I apologize. Nobody's tweeting here except for Taylor Lorenz. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the support. And yeah, it's it's absolutely crazy. It's absolutely crazy. But it is not done, right? It is not done. So let's scroll back up to the top, as I promised. And we will see that this entire thing is gotten worse. Or as Eric Wempel says at the top, to get again, give you a kind of connotation, a hint at how he feels about this whole thing. The fallout from the Lorenz story continues. On Thursday, members of the Post Features staff held a meeting with Post Executive Editor Sally Busby, Senior Managing Editor Cameron Barr, Managing Editor of Diversity and Inclusion Krista Thompson, and Managing Editor of Digital News Kat Downs Mulder. At issue was a letter from Features staffers citing an article in the Daily Beast identifying Deputy Features Editor David Mallett's as the one who inserted the mistake about comment requests to YouTube cr content creators and reporting that the affair may cost Mallets a promotion to top features editor. It's a very long sentence in this update, but what this says is that staffers at the Washington Post apparently wrote a letter to their managing editor saying that there's an issue because the Daily Beast has identified the editor that Taylor Lorenz hinted at David Mallett's here as the one who inserted the mistake and it may cost him a promotion to top features editor. He's apparently deputy features editor and he was set to be promoted to top features editor. Now, why do these features staffers think that was the case? Well, according to three sources at the meeting, one reporter pressed Busby, remember she's the head of all this, on specifics, saying that colleagues had learned that Busby had offered Mallett's the job on Thursday, June 2nd and then rescinded the offer the following Monday. Busby, according to these sources, didn't deny the timeline, which isn't, of course, the same as accepting the truthfulness of it, but insisted that Mallets was in no way punished for his mistake. Staffers who spoke at the meeting, according to the sources, were furious with Busby's decision and asked whether it could be reversed. She was resistant to that suggestion, say the sources. A Post spokeswoman said, again, to Mr. Wemple, we will not be commenting. Can't get anything out of his employer. Uh, but he can publish these at least. So I guess give credit where it's due. So after this article goes up, the feature staff at the Washington Post has another insurrection within the halls of this institution. Says, look, we found out that our current deputy features guy was going to be the head guy. And he got his job canceled, essentially, after he was offered it on Thursday and after the weekend's events with Taylor Lorenz really having a very, very long Twitter exchange and attacking everybody and everyone on uh, that platform over the weekend. He gets the job offer rescinded on Monday. Seems like Eric Wemple wants us to believe that that's the truth. There's no indication that it is not and that the executive editor here is refusing to otherwise change that up, which leaves you, at least in terms of tone and suggestion, from this author that with the notion that Taylor Lorenz is the center of the maelstrom here, that this all happens because Taylor Lorenz goes out with an article like this, goes out and attacks everybody and everything after it all happens, says it's a right wing conspiracy, calls various YouTubers that want to comment on these topics, radicalized influencers. I don't know, maybe we'll do a shirt or something with that on it. Uh, and then all hell breaks loose, and there's another loss of faith, another mutiny within this particular journalistic outlet. And it gets reported on in their own pages. Uh, so there is all hell breaking loose at the Washington Post right now. Honestly, with this set of events, I'm not sure uh, that Ms. Busby here uh, is, is going to last a very long time in this role. Maybe she writes the ship and we never hear her name again. But as it stands right this second, there are so, so many problems. And this is not what you want from your newspaper. You don't want 
all of this to go out there. We say all press is good press. This isn't the kind of thing that helps you trust the Washington Post to get things right. It's all politics. It's all sniping. It's all teenagers. It's all high school. And frankly, it's a little bit disappointing because the Washington Post is a major paper. It is a paper that has a high level of circulation and people watching what it does here in the United States. And I don't know whether that'll last because honestly, this is the kind of thing that is a real turnoff for me uh, looking at all of this going on behind the scenes and in back offices and whatnot. So that's the story I wanted to talk about. I think somebody said blameception. That really is what it feels like to me is we've got this situation here where the Washington Post just keeps finding people to blame and losing the faith of the people that they really need it from uh, the most. Uh, and so that's the article for this morning. We got just a couple more super chats. We might be finishing really early today. Uh, get you on your way uh, for your Monday morning hangouts with whoever you're hanging out with in real life. Uh, but Jemima, keep up the needed scrutiny. Thank you so much for the support, Jemima. And Mega Hira, did you see that Natalie Lawyer Chick hit over 100,000? I did see that. I wasn't able to join yesterday uh, because I was otherwise unavailable. Uh, but I very much uh, am excited about that growth for her. She was just on the channel uh, last week. She's a fantastic follow. Check out Natalie the Lawyer Chick uh, if you are at all interested uh, in, in what you saw last week from her here. And I would recommend checking her out anyway because she has some really good content and she's very, very smart. Celebration, partying emoji. Thank you so much, uh, Magira. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, everybody else, uh, honestly, if you have anything else, just flag it for me as a question. Certainly we got at least you know, 10 more minutes, we can hang out here before we all have to get to work. Uh, but otherwise, I thank everybody for popping in as they do. We again have 2000 plus people here in this space at such an early hour. And that is such a fantastic thing. I'm so excited about this show and continuing. I also I have another announcement, I guess, is kind of back office cleanup. You might have seen we started the Just the Headlines playlist. A number of you asked me to essentially just have the parts where I go through an article and talk about the specifics of that article to bring in uh, rather than the hangouts and things, which are fun. I think everybody likes them. I certainly like them. I know the community likes them, uh, but are, you know, a little bit random. Sometimes people ask me about my favorite Final Fantasy characters. Sometimes people asking me uh, about things of a much more serious bent and folks just want to be able to focus on the articles. So behind the scenes, we've been putting together versions of just the headlines for these episodes to bring in to that playlist. Uh, yes, you have a co-counsel. Yes, I, I will do that. Absolutely. Uh, Co-counsel says, make sure I catch all the super chats. I will check again, but I think I've, I think I've done a good job today. Uh, we will see. Uh, but yes, we're going to have almost all the headlines, I think, uh, pop into that playlist. So just ignore a, a big uh, set of videos that'll go in here uh, over the course of the next few days uh, so that everybody has that playlist ready. You can just play that, just hear about the headlines, not go off on wild tangents talking about other things. Uh, so hopefully that is helpful to the folks that asked for it. I think it's a good addition to the channel, and I thank you for the recommendation. Uh, that will be happening uh, soon. So let's see here. Britt Cormier, why am I getting visions of a news radio and the newspaper from The Wire when you read this article? In The Wire, they have someone making up news sources. However, this is all the comedy of news radio. Yeah, right? So news radio, fantastic. Phil Hartman, uh, Steve Root. Uh, who I think testified in the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard trial. Not really, just a person that looked a lot like him. Um, but News Radio, very, very funny. Do check that out. I don't have any idea what surface it's on uh, right now. Uh, but yeah, it it feels like it, right? It feels like kids. It feels like a school paper with all of the kind of political movement and things like that. And you just don't want to feel that way about someone that you're trusting to tell you the truth about the world around you. And it's just unfortunate. It's terribly unfortunate from my perspective. Thank you so much, Britt. I really appreciate it. Uh, Adita, thank you for Alita for co-hosting the charity stream. Absolutely. I especially love the game with the participation of the public. Thumbs up. Yeah, we played some Jackbox games there. Uh, we'll probably do that in this space uh, in the future uh, as well as other games. But I, I launched this show. We got to get this working. And schedule-wise, I want to make sure that we do that. Uh, I am planning on skipping one day a week. Uh, right now, I'm doing four episodes a week during the business week. I think right now, like last week, we'll skip Wednesday, uh, just so that you know. Uh, and maybe that will be our schedule moving forward. But again, we're just trying to evaluate what works, uh, what makes sure that this can continue on a good pace and still get out Virtual Legality Prime episodes. 
Uh, we got out two last week. I would love to have that number at at least three uh, per week to go with Hangouts and Headlines. And I think we'd be doing pretty good on content before adding some more stuff uh, that we might have planned. So I really, really appreciate it. What is the Go Blue song? Hail to the Victors? You look up Hail to the Victors. It's a little early in the morning uh, for me to start singing, but Hail to the Victors is my alma mater song uh, and the best college football fight song in all the land. Um, so you can check that out. Uh, my wife is trying to make sure that I didn't miss any super chats that I can see. So we're going to do a quick scroll back again. But I think we did good this time. I think we made it out just fine. So co-counsel, I really appreciate it. Uh, making sure that I didn't miss any this time. Uh, but otherwise, I think we got everything. Except for this last one. Zach Frisch, if you had an employee who went on a public blame campaign, why on earth would you keep them around and back them? Well, it depends, right? When you're in academia or you're in journalism, one of the things you're fighting against at the same time is this notion of kind of freedom of speech principles, right? We've talked in this space about freedom of speech being really only Congress, only the government throwing you in a cage for saying a bad thing. And that's true. But certain places like universities, like newspapers, have a broader concept that they want to represent the concept of freedom of speech, that we want professors to be able to say what they will without fear of firing, because that's how you have the battle of ideas. That's how you kind of get through argumentation, because we don't want someone from above to be judging them on something that might be otherwise controversial, but ultimately right, uh, because the public can otherwise sway things one way or another. Now, that said, I think you can absolutely cross the line. And I think what happened at the Washington Post absolutely did that. By the time you're giving the second or third warning that says, don't snipe at each other, and then she doubles down in the immediate aftermath of that, at some point, you have to fire them. And she was fired for effectively insubordination. Look, this is how we're trying to control what is good for this institution and the trust people should have within it. And if you can't follow those rules you aren't acting in our best interest, and so we can fire you. So I think it was legitimate at that point in time, but reasonable minds can differ on that. You saw uh, Natalie uh, from uh, the New Republic talking with us last week. She went out there on Twitter and said she thought that firing was ridiculous. Now, she's a journalist, and that makes sense, but I tend to disagree. I tend to say at some point you have to be able to control the movement of your ship or else you're, you don't have a ship at all. You've given it up. Uh, to the people that you've hired. And anybody can make a wrong-headed hire. It's, it's very difficult to fully be able to predict how people that you're otherwise going to hire are going to work within your institution uh, or your organization. You could be much smaller than the Washington Post and hire somebody and say, oh, actually, that person is a net negative for what we want to do uh, as a group together. And we should look into doing something about it. But, you know, she's protected by a union. Uh, she, there's a whole bunch of other things that go into that particular uh, equation. And here, the Washington Post finally had enough. And I can't say that they were wrong. Michael J.M., what are the chances the promotion was rescinded because he stealth edited the fix, not because of the error itself? I think that's a fantastic question. We're not getting any information on any of this, right? And I, we don't know who stealth edited the fix. Uh, one can presume uh, it's him. That was the biggest deal to me at the start. You could see me kind of shocked that it happened on video as I note that it did, because I wasn't expecting that. Because I do actually expect kind of a baseline rule of we're not going to edit out things that we're called out on without noting that we did. Um, that that kind of as a fundamental first principles notion is, if I'm going to trust you at all, it's that you're not going to change your articles on me and not tell me that you did so. Uh, and the Washington Post clearly didn't follow that. Uh, and that is a big, big, big deal to me. But it's also a big deal that when they get an editor's note in there, it appears to be absolutely wrong. And they refuse to talk about it to their own journalist, who is a friendly face, one would assume. Uh, and they don't otherwise clear that up. So I think it could be. The stealth edit is worse than the original inclusion. Right. Again, I've said in a number of spaces, including here, I see this as something that could have been solved very quickly with effectively um, that was included accidentally uh, due to a miscommunication. We regret the error. It goes away. And it never comes back. And that they tried to fix it in a, in a number of different ways. There's the interim fix that doesn't get mentioned as much where they put the lines back in that Alita declined to comment and that umbrella guy could not be reached for comment. And then the, and the correction is just, we talked about it wrongly before. 
only it doubled down on that wrongness. They get called out again. That's why an editor's note pops in. So it could be that this individual is correcting things badly as well and, and is covering for something. I, I can't speculate as to why this is happening. My tweet on this is why in the world would the Washington Post double down on this when it doesn't matter? The fact that you didn't contact Alita Majeka before you put her reference for, to a Business Insider article in your uh, opinion piece does not matter. Why are you doing this right now? And I haven't gotten a good answer to that from anyone, including the Washington Post. Secret McSquirrel, don't miss this one. I feel like I'm being challenged. I did not miss it, Secret McSquirrel. I'm doing my best. Actually, the the uh, StreamYard has worked a lot better uh, today than it was before. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we've gotten past the hump uh, on the problems here uh, moving forward. Uh, Mimi, thoughts on Amber Heard doing a one-hour interview on NBC on Friday? I didn't know it existed until this super chat. Is that really what's going to happen? Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, good luck. Uh, we might have to cover that. We might have to cover that. We probably have to transcribe it, but... We might have to cover that. Thank you for letting me know. I have no thoughts on that. Um, so I will keep my eyes open. Um, and I see uh, I see Detective Seeds out here in the chat. Hey, Detective Seeds, we got to get likes over a thousand. Yeah, like and subscribe if you enjoy this kind of content. Always appreciated. Smash that like button like a spider on the wall, baby. You hate it when you get the spider guts on the wall. You got to be careful with those spiders, uh, Detective Seeds. Uh, but I really appreciate it. And... I think I got everything that co-counsel has warned me about. Uh, she's very worried about me, uh, of course. So I think that's going to do it for this morning. A, a quick, a svelte hour-long episode. Not svelte for YouTube standards, but certainly svelte for us here in Hangouts and Headline Standards. Now, I do want to mention, as I said, I think we're going to try to do four episodes a week right now. We'll see if that works. Um, uh, right now, we're planning on skipping Wednesday. If you have any stories... Uh, DM me, uh, DM them to me on Twitter. That's the best way to reach me. Um, and let's start trying to move out of Amber Heard, Johnny Depp territory. I've got some cool stuff uh, that I think we could talk about, how it's reported on, maybe talk about the legalities of some things uh, that I'm looking forward to. But this is not intended to be a show that is only headlines related to Depp be heard. Truthfully, this headline wasn't, even though that was the genesis point of the story. But Anything that you find interesting that you think would be worthwhile of analysis doesn't even necessarily need to be in the legal space. I intend to draw in some technology and some video game stuff and some movie stuff as well. Uh, please feel free to send them to me. I love hearing from you. I love getting those tips. And when I get it from a number of different people, I know that it's something that um, you guys would be interested in. So thank you, everybody that has dropped in this morning for an early morning hangout. I'm going to send you out on your way here at 8 a.m. Eastern. I really appreciate it, everybody. I will see you on the BitCast stream, which will be simulcast on this channel in about five hours. Uh, otherwise, if I don't see you then, I'll see you on the next Virtual Legality. And thanks so much for dropping by. And for all of the community donating so much to the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, I'm still blown away by that. Thank you so much and have a great day.